Hello everyone and welcome to Cinematic Excrements. According to my schedule, the next stop on my quest to review every movie that has won Worst Picture is 2010's The Last Airbender. But that can't possibly be right because there is no movie called The Last Airbender. There never was. I mean, who would take one of the most beloved television shows of all time and turn it into such a terrible movie. No one would ever do such a thing. You must have imagined it. It was probably just a bad dream. There is no Last Airbender movie. This isn't working, is it? No, no, I thought not. Well, it's time to take, you can zoom back out now. Yeah, thank you. It's time to take a second look at The Last Airbender. Based on a very popular and critically acclaimed animated series, The Last Airbender was written and directed by the infamous M. Night Shyamalan. I first covered this way back in the early days of my show when I was still using that shitty webcam. And after rewatching this movie over a decade and a few equipment upgrades later, I was very surprised to discover it's actually much better than I remember. Nah, I'm just kidding. It still sucks. So many things in this movie went wrong that I hardly know where to begin. Maybe we should start with the casting. I mean, were these really Shyamalan's first choices or were they just the only people who said yes? Asif Manvi as Commander Zhao? Talented guy, don't get me wrong, but what was the thought process in casting a Daily Show correspondent as a headstrong military commander? Cliff Curtis as Fire Lord Ozai? Again, talented actor, but doesn't really have the intimidating presence to play the Fire Lord, especially with those sideburns. I can't believe I didn't notice that the first time around. They're like reverse mutton chops. Did the makeup department accidentally glue them on backwards and they just went with it? And the Fire Lord's entire family is confusing as hell. His son Zuko is Dev Patel, an Indian. His brother Iroh is Sean Tube, a Persian. And Curtis is a Maori. Not Indian, as I incorrectly stated in my initial review. Sorry about that. You would think I could tell the difference between an Indian and a Maori, but it turns out I'm actually a complete idiot. But yeah, almost every character was miscast, and not just the ones that were whitewashed, though they did kind of stand out, especially considering the director himself is a person of color. How do you of all people not get it? And if you're going to whitewash a character, you could at least cast a white person who can act. Did no one see Jackson Rathbone in the Twilight movies? How did they not see this coming? Of course, the dialogue in this movie was so terrible that even talented actors couldn't pull this off. To be fair, there are occasional good moments, like this bit where the fire soldiers are trying to arrest a young earthbender. He was bending tiny stones at us from behind a tree. It really hurt. That was actually kind of funny, and it fits the tone of the show pretty well. But other than that, it's rare to hear someone in this movie sound like an actual human. And it's very rare to hear dialogue that isn't exposition. I think the only movie I've seen that has more expositional dialogue is Cats, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. That movie's day will come. But yeah, this movie went way overboard with the exposition. You know you screwed up your storytelling when one of your characters starts a line with, As you know! Well, if we know, why are you telling us? And the main reason we have so much exposition is Shyamalan decided to adapt the entire first season of the show in a 90-minute movie. Why? Well, because all of his previous movies were 90 minutes. No, really, that was actually his explanation for the runtime. What a clown. This meant many events in the cartoon were abridged or cut entirely due to time constraints. We got the Cliff's Notes version of how Zuko got his scar. We don't even get the Cliff's Notes version of Sokka's relationship with Princess Yue. The movie just tells us they're a thing now, and that's it. The Siege of the Northern Water Tribe was a lot shorter and does not include Aang joining with the Ocean Spirit. Instead, he just creates a big tidal wave. Weak. They filmed scenes with the Kiyoshi Warriors, but they were left out of the final cut with the hopes of introducing them in the second movie, but obviously that's not happening. And we never got to meet June the Bounty Hunter, Jet's Freedom Fighters, the Mechanists, Avatar Roku, and several other characters who played important roles in the series. And the cuts weren't the only changes Shyamalan made from the source material. The pronunciation of several names were changed, Ong instead of Aang, Sokka instead of Sokka, because Shyamalan wanted to stay true to the authentic Asian pronunciation. 
while casting white people to play the characters. Pick a lane, Shyamalan. And the movie can't seem to make up its mind how Avatar should be pronounced. The Avatar. The Avatar. The Avatar. The Avatar. The Avatar. The Avatar. The Avatar! Is it Avatar or Avatar? Even the same characters don't always pronounce it the same way. Considering Shyamalan was such a stickler for proper pronunciation, you'd think he would have caught that. It wasn't very smart. Furthermore, most firebenders are only able to manipulate fire and can't actually create it, which was not the case in the show. This even becomes a plot point when the Fire Nation invades the Northern Water Tribe, and they suggest they should put out as many fires in the city as possible so the fire soldiers can't use it against them. Yet it doesn't look like they actually bother to do that. Oops. Apart from Appa and Momo, we see very little of the hybrid animals the TV show is known for, and what in Kiyoshi's name did they do to Appa's face? That must have given so many children nightmares. It probably gave a fair number of adults nightmares. Shyamalan also decided to state in the movie that the Avatar is not able to have a family, which is a major departure from the series for no reason at all. It has no bearing on the plot whatsoever. I don't know what they were thinking. There was really only one change the movie made that I actually agreed with, and it has to do with Princess Yue's hair. And no, I'm not referring to the fact that, when viewed from behind, her hair looks like a penis. Do I need to blur this out? I'm not sure. Anyway, in the show, Princess Yue was born very sick, and her life was saved by the Moon Spirit, which turned her hair from black to white. After Zhao killed the Moon Spirit, Yue saved the spirit's life at the cost of her own. This happens in the movie as well, but unlike the show, her hair turns back to black. And that actually makes sense. It's a relatively minor change, but it's one of the few positive things I have to say about the movie, so I will take it. But you know something? I've highlighted many of this movie's problems, but I haven't even gotten to the worst one. Avatar The Last Airbender is a very action-oriented show, and the action sequences in the show were pretty well done. So you would expect the movie to have a fair amount of action as well, and it does, and it is so painfully slow. This is apparent right from the start when they recreate the Four Elements intro from the show with some martial artists in front of a very wrinkled screen. This movie had a $150 million budget, and they couldn't afford a steamer. This intro lasts about 10 seconds in the show. In the movie, it's twice as long. And the rest of the action sequences are even worse. It takes a ridiculous amount of jumping and flipping and dancing around for characters to perform even the simplest bending moves. So any scene that involves any amount of bending drags ass. The show was energetic and exciting. The movie is a cure for insomnia. I don't know if there's anything else to say. The Last Airbender is terrible in nearly every way. It was nominated for nine Razzies and took home five. Besides Worst Picture, it won Worst Screenplay, Worst Director, Worst Supporting Actor for Jackson Rathbone, and Worst Eye-Gouging Misuse of 3D, a special award that was only given out that year. It was the height of the 3D craze, after all. I never saw the movie in 3D, but considering how dark some of the scenes are, and the fact that it was a 3D post-conversion when that technology wasn't really up to snuff yet, I have no doubt that this was a miserable experience in 3D. Of course, seeing it in 2D was a miserable experience, but never mind. You're lying! As for the question I so often ask in these second looks, was it really the worst picture of 2010? The answer for me is a resounding yes. The Razzies got it right this year. And really, I don't think it had that much competition in the worst picture category. The other nominees that year were The Bounty Hunter, a mediocre comedy about, what else? A bounty hunter and his ex-wife, a journalist, who are both really shockingly bad at their jobs. Sex in the City 2, a two and a half hour slog, but not really bad enough to top The Last Airbender in my opinion. Although, due to how it portrayed the Middle East, if they had given out an award for most racist picture that year, it would have won hands down. The Twilight Saga Eclipse. You wait your turn, Twilight Saga. And Vampires Suck. Why, yes, it is a Seltzerberg comedy. How did you guess? Although, honestly, this was one of their better efforts. It still sucked, but at least they largely focused on the Twilight movies and why they are bad, instead of just throwing out random pop culture references all the time. However, they did cast a couple of white dudes to play Jacob and his father, who are Native Americans. 
Seriously, how was there not a most racist picture category that year? Missed opportunity! Anyway, The Last Airbender was dreadful, and I don't know how the studio could have expected any other result. Shyamalan was already a controversial filmmaker by this point, after The Village, Lady in the Water, and The Happening. For the life of me, I cannot understand why they chose him. Nor do I understand why they shut out input from the show's creators as they reportedly did. The end result was, sadly, predictable. While it technically made a profit when you factor in the worldwide gross, it was poorly received by almost everyone who saw it. One critic in particular, Charlie Jane Anders, said The Last Airbender, quote, makes Dragon Ball Evolution look like a masterpiece. I would not go that far. I get where you're coming from, Charlie. I do, really. But let's not get carried away here. And here's a funny anecdote for you. Well, not funny haha, -ha, but my niece actually took my nephew to see the movie as a birthday present. I'm sure I don't have to tell you this did not go over well. No one likes getting anticipation for their birthday. Way to go, Shyamalan. You made my niece a bad sister. I hope you're proud of yourself. In summary, the story was bad, the dialogue was terrible, the action sequences were boring, the acting was atrocious, and it utterly fails as an adaptation of the source material. But the effects were decent. And with that in mind, there is one thing that I would like to personally say to Mr. M. Night Shyamalan now that I have had to sit through The Last Airbender several times for two separate reviews, because yes, I do actually watch movies all the way through when I review them, to you, Mr. Shyamalan, you rat bastard, I say this. Thank you. There's no joke there, I mean it. Thank you, Mr. Shyamalan, because if I hadn't chosen to review your god-awful movie, I might never have discovered what became one of my favorite TV shows of all time. I did not watch the show when it originally hit the airwaves in 2005. I was in my 20s at the time and, as you might expect, wasn't watching much Nickelodeon apart from the occasional Nick at Night reruns. But when I decided to review The Last Airbender, having heard many terrible things about the movie and learning it was adapted from a popular TV series, I figured I should at least watch a handful of episodes to get a feel for where the movie went wrong as an adaptation. So I started with episode one and ended up binging the entire first season. And after finishing the review, I bought all three seasons on DVD. Where were shows like this when I was a kid? The show is everything the movie is not. It has an engaging story, imaginative world building, great characters with actual emotional depth who speak like real human beings, excellent voice acting, exciting action sequences, and fantastic animation. Somebody get me a thesaurus because I'm running out of positive adjectives. I love this show. I was immediately hooked on the concept of harnessing the power of the four elements. The heroes and villains alike had their own interesting arcs. And because I know someone will ask, Toph is my favorite character. And I'm kind of glad the first movie wasn't well received, so Shyamalan didn't get a chance to butcher her in the sequel. Iroh is a close second. R.I.P. Mako. And it is a shame that such a great series led to such a crappy movie. But honestly... I'm not so sure it could have been made into a good movie. I mean, it could have been a better movie in more capable hands, but it was never going to rise to the same level as the series. And there are two reasons for that. One, trying to cram 20 episodes worth of story into a feature film is a tall order for any filmmaker, even if you're not limiting yourself to a 90-minute runtime for no good goddamn reason. And two, the style of the visuals and the action sequences is much better suited for animation. Even if the movie were in more capable hands, I don't think what the animators accomplished with Avatar The Last Airbender would translate well to live action. That apparently will not stop Netflix from trying, however. And don't get me wrong, I want the live action series to be good. I really do, and I wish them nothing but the best. But I have concerns, especially since the last live action remake of an animated series I saw was Cowboy Bebop, and it wasn't bad, but it left something to be desired. Mustafa Shakur was really good as Jet, though. He nailed that role, but I digress. Bottom line, the show is one of the best I've ever seen and is absolutely worth your time. And while the sequel series, The Legend of Korra, didn't quite live up to its predecessor, I still enjoyed it overall and would recommend that as well. The movie is not worth your time at all. It's not even ironically enjoyable. It's just plain bad. 
but I would make an exception for watching it with the riff tracks. Listening to Mike, Kevin, and Bill cracking jokes is about the only way I can tolerate sitting through this movie. We were forced under the water of the ocean. The water of the ocean, much like the air of the sky or the flame of the fire. Right. Mike, Kevin, Bill, thank you for your service. And I think that's all I have to say about this movie that was produced on the land of the earth. Next time, we will revisit the first movie to sweep the Golden Raspberry Awards. Which means we will once again be subjected to Adam Sandler in drag. May God help us all. Thank you.